so like I said, yeah, we're going to do just chronologically chapters one through six. So, um, and I try to pick out the stuff that I think is important that was really like, uh, you know, important in upcoming chapters and whatnot that we use. So um, that's what we're going to kind of go over. So for chapter one, we talked a lot about um, the different types of uh, variables that we have. And then, so remember that we have sample statistics and population parameters. These words always go together. You're never gonna have a sample parameter or population statistic. Those aren't things. Um, sometimes people get those messed up. Um, remember, this is like the biggest thing. Every semester I see people mess up and it's a simple thing that you, you guys can definitely understand. It's just, these are the symbols that you use for sample statistics and these are the symbols used for population parameters. Okay, so if you're talking about a population proportion, you're always gonna use P. You're not gonna use P hat. That's just, that's not gonna happen. So that's, this is just something to keep in mind. Like when you're writing out um, hypothesis tests, your null and alternative hypotheses are always gonna be written with either mu or p. Okay, you're never gonna have something else going on there. That's just not how it is. Um, so yeah, these are just things to keep in mind. Sometimes I, you know, tell people to write these out so you remember that just, and also so you understand, you know, um, if you see X bar, you know they're talking about a sample mean and not a population mean, that kind of thing. So, um, but just remember, um, random variables, they do vary, and then populations are gonna be fixed. Um, sometimes I draw the little umbrella thing that people tell me looks like a pie, but I don't care, I'm not a, as every professor says, I'm not an artist, but I'm gonna draw it on the board. Okay, so this is your population, and then you take a bunch of samples out of it, which are your little raindrops out here. Um, so we got our samples and you want these to be um, You want these to be randomized in order for them to re be representative and then I always draw it in aspects of this So you take your samples from the population and your samples are used to make an inference um, About the population so because samples are easier to analyze than the entire population So that's why you're using these to make an inference about the population. And that's why you want the samples to be representative um, of our of our um, population. So amazing, cool. So yeah, that's just something that's like the basis. Um, but remember like these symbols are very important. Okay, so we have explanatory variables and response variables. Uh, we have our explanatory variable, which is independent. Um, it explains the difference in our response variable, which is the outcome variable that is dependent upon the explanatory variable. Um, and in terms of if you write this on a distribution, our explanatory variable um, is always going to be on the x-axis, and then our response variable is always going to be on the y-axis. So, and I always remember it like explanatory has x, you know, explanatory. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, that's something that's easily messed up. So. If you think about it, you know, whatever happens down here on the x-axis, you know, whenever you're plotting points, you figure out where it is on the x-axis, and then depending on where that is, that'll decide where it is on, you know, the y-axis and what the response would be. So remember, this is dependent upon the explanatory variable, which is independent. So, yeah, variables, they're variable. All right, um, so just a few other things about independent and dependent um, variables. So um, independent means that they're unrelated. They don't affect each other. This is kind of, they're saying the same thing. Um, and then uh, if it's dependent, they do affect each other. So if something happens to one, it's going to affect the other one. Paired and matched pairs, um, talking about these, this is saying that when um, they're dependent on one another and it's as many times subjects are the same in both groups. Um, this is something if we have, you know, like, students one two three four etc and we have like their um, lab one score and then we have like the quiz one score um, and then we wanted to compare for each student um, this is showing that you know the subject is going to be the same in each one you know because you're going to have this is both for subject one um, but the pairs between lab one and quiz one and you're trying to see um, if they affect each other and in what way so they're dependent upon one another because you're predicting that um, someone's lab one score you know impacts their quiz one score or something like that so that's what we mean by it might be the same subject in both groups there okay all right chapters two and three which we're talking about describing data um, so when we're describing data, we can talk about either categorical variables 
or quantitative, so categorical. Cat is an animal, so animals are an example of categorical variables. Um, and they would also be nominal because they don't have any order. Um, so these could be things like colors, um, brands of something, uh, like material types, uh, anything that basically is only a category, doesn't have a numerical value associated with it. Um, and then ordinal are the same thing. They're still labels. They don't have any numerical value, except they do have some sort of hierarchy um, to them. So you can have like, uh, like bronze, silver, gold, gold, forgot the D in there, gold, bronze, silver, and then gold, that's an example of um, an ordinal categorical variable. There's still categories, but there is some sort of hierarchy. Same thing with like um, freshman, sophomore, so on and so forth. That's going to be categorical um, ordinal because there is a hierarchy to, um, you know, class standings. Quantitative have a numerical value. Um, and discrete means they can only take on a certain set of numbers between the max and the min. This is often like, you know, people, um, you know, things that you can't split up. So it can only have like whole numbers. Continuous are things like um, measurements and in terms of like, I guess you could like uh, any type of like weight or height, inches, centimeters, uh, so on and so forth. So these once again have some sort of numerical value associated with them, but they either can only take on a set number of uh, values or they can go on and on and on um, and have you know decimals and whatnot. So those are our types of variables. So we have our quantitative data display. So um, our box plot, histogram, and dot plot, these are going to be um, the ones represented right over here. Um, it, We'll talk about scatter plots in a second, but these are ways you can represent quantitative data. Um, our box plot is the one that we can kind of talk about our quartiles in. So if we draw it out um, down here as an example, um, just remember what is shown on here. So remember we have our minimum down at the bottom, we have our maximum. We also can have like outliers um, on some of these sides. And then remember we do have our um, quartiles here. So Q1, Q2, Q3. Um, Q2 is always going to be our median. Um, and then if we're talking about percentiles, it's going to be our 25th percentile, uh, 50th percentile, and then 75th percentile for a Q3. Um, and the percentiles are just saying what percent of the data lies at or below um, that value. And then do remember that the IQR is going to be this area in here. Um, and also the box does, comp does complete the middle 50% of the data. So you have 25% over here, 25% there. Um, but don't let that get you messed up in terms of the, um, in terms of uh, percentile. So if we're talking about the 25th percentile, that means that um, at Q1 or below, so all this stuff, this is gonna be 25% of the data um, that lies there. That's what the 25th percentile means in terms of that. All right, so then, and the histograms and dot plots are similar, except for histograms are um, used more for larger um, data sets. Um, and then because you can make these, you know, the x-axis or the y-axis, like, however much you want, um, you know, for dot plots, you put each singular thing. So if you have, like, a 1,000 um, points on one of these, you don't want to be putting a 1,000 dots unless you have a lot of time on your hands. Um, but so, yeah, that's, like, an advantage of having a, um, histogram because you can use it for larger data sets. Um, okay, so this is going to be talking about scatter plots. So once again, these are for quantitative variables, but they are going to be for um, two of them instead of just one. So we have four different things that we talk about in terms of scatter plots. So we have our direction, which is positive or negative. So if we look at this example here on the side, I'm going to say that this one's negative because going from left to right, it's going into downward motion. So I'd say this one's negative. Form is going to be linear, nonlinear. This one looks like a line to me. Um, so anything that if you saw would be like something googly like that, or like if you saw like a parabola or something, those ones are going to be nonlinear. Um, but we do want it to be linear, so that is something we want to keep in mind um, for to if we end up making uh, conclusions about it. Our strength is going to be uh, weak, moderate, or strong, depending on how close the um, dots are together. This one I'd probably say, and you can also kind of like combine them. It's kind of like moderately strong. I'd say it's getting pretty close to being strong. To get, the dots are pretty close together. And outliers, I don't really see any here, but if I were to put like a value over here, that'd be an outlier, something that's like super far off from like any point that's there. And once again, here we have our explanatory and response variable, as we talked about earlier, on our x-axis here for explanatory, and then y-axis is our response variable. All right. 
so then, oh yeah, and this is just a reminder of um, the different shapes um, that we can have our data in, um, skewed to the left, skewed to the right, and symmetrical, and then in terms, like what does that mean in terms of our mean, median, and mode? Our median's always gonna be in the middle, um, no matter what. Um, but the difference is for skewed to the left, our mode is going to be on the right, the most um, commonly occurring value, while in skewed to the right, our com most commonly occurring value is gonna be on the left, and our mean is gonna be um, wherever the most spread is, which makes sense, because that's like the most value, so our mean's gonna be on whatever side that is, so left for left skew, right for right skew. Symmetrical mean equals medium, which equals mode, kind of makes sense um, in that aspect. All right. Okay, so these are categorical data displays. So same idea um, in terms of displaying data, but this is gonna be for categories, not numerical values. Um, so it's the bar graphs are showing you the frequency of different categories here. So you have your categories on the X axis, and then you know the frequency of them or um, you know, what you're measuring on the Y. Um, and then these two examples over here, these are just talking about if you had um, two variables, um, categorical variables, those are going to be when you could do stack bar charts or side by side. Um, it's just representing both of them and both of them, the key is showing each uh, group in different colors, um, but you can either put them side by side here or um, stack them on one another, whatever floats your boat. Um, and then you have your two-way tables. This one's just talking about, once again, you do have two variables. Um, so from this point down, we're talking about two variables. So here we have like gender um, and then we have sport. So those are our two categorical variables that we're um, looking at. So then you can kind of see the crossover for those, you know, how many females, their favorite sport is football, you find that intersection there, so on and so forth. And then you always have your totals of the columns and then your row totals too is always gonna be there. And this is always gonna be your sample size, um, you know, the entire situation there. All right, risk and odds. So getting into probability, because I know everyone loves probability. So fun. Um, probability. So risk and odds are both describing the likelihood of an event, which kind of messes some people up, I think. Um, but you do need to keep in mind they are talking about different things. They are interpreting the likelihood of an event in different ways. Um, so risk is basically the same thing as probability. It's just saying the probability that an event will occur in general. You know, so you use this equation here, number with the outcome divided by the total number of outcomes. But the difference between that and odds is the odds is comparing it to um, the event not happening, which is why our denominator is talking about the number without the outcome. So um, if we know that risk is the, you know, if risk is a probability that something's occurring, that means that one minus risk is going to be whatever it is without the outcome, which is why we could also use this equation, um, you know, only if you already have, um, if you're already like given the risk, uh, that's when I would use this one. But if you're looking for odds, I wouldn't first calculate risk and then use this equation. I would probably just go straight to this one. Um, it's the most straightforward. So same idea. So like I said, risk just the probability that something will occur. Um, odds is the probability of an event happening versus it not happening. Um, so just interpreting them in different ways, kind of giving us different information. All right, so let's talk about confidence intervals. So confidence intervals are basically, this is where we get a range of data. So remember, it's different than hypothesis tests where we kind of come to some sort of um, informed conclusion. Confidence intervals is giving us a range of data where we're kind of making an inference of, you know, in terms of that, where is, um, you know, is our, we think that our population parameter is within this or whatever. So, um, this is our general equation, our point estimate plus or minus two times our standard error. This two is if we're talking about a 95% confidence interval like I wrote down there. So you're either gonna have something like this, p hat plus or minus two times your standard error, um, which is, there's an equation for that, but, or you're gonna have x bar. So remember, once again, this is what I'm saying when those um, symbols come into play, you're only gonna have p hat or x bar because this is your sample statistic. Um, your sample statistic is your point estimate, so you're going to use p hat or x bar. You're not using p or mu um, for this because it's a sample. So p hat or x bar and then two times the standard error of your mean. Um, so these are kind of the two equations you can have. And once again, I'm using two as a default for a 95% confidence interval. You guys probably remember that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that in a second about, you know, why we use two. But um, this number technically can be anything, but it's dependent on, you know, what percent confidence interval you have. That's how it would change. Um, standard error is just another way we'd say the standard deviation of our sampling distribution because our 
uh, standard deviation usually is just, you know, sigma, which is our, you know, standard deviation of a uh, proportion. Um, but so yeah, remember, this is just a reminder that categorical goes with uh, proportion, quantitative goes with means. Um, so if you're trying to figure out if you should be doing a test for means or proportions, think about what type of variable is it? Um, is it like labels and names or is it um, has some values associated with it? And then this is um, a side note just uh, to keep in mind that um, when you increase your sample size, um, the confidence interval is going to be, um, I guess I'm going to say smaller, shorter, more narrow. Um, so, and that makes sense because saying if you increase your sample size, more representative of the population gets getting closer to the actual population size. So you can be more confident that your values are in a smaller um, area. So that's why it's going to decrease there. All right. And then, like I said, this is just describing why, um, why like confidence interval, like for example, why 95% confidence interval use our, uses the uh, multiplier as two, because according to the empirical rule, 95% of the data lies um, between plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean. So if we're standardizing, you know, if we were to standardize um, whatever like variable we had, um, we would go forth and do it this way and find it that um, no matter what it is, it's gonna be two standard deviations away from that mean. So, <laughs> sorry, I think my thing broke during my last review, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so anyway, so yeah, that's um, our standard deviation. The standard deviation is two, um, which is why we utilize that um, as our value. So, Yep, living the dream over here. All right, let me clear up. All right, so, all right, and then we're gonna finish up with hypothesis testing and then do some review questions. Um, so, we have here that when you're uh, writing hypotheses, you're always gonna have that there's no change. Um, so it's always gonna be an equal sign here. Um, and then, <laughs> this doesn't work, okay. So I was gonna have an equal sign. Um, and then uh, your alter, that's just not, that's not an equal sign, okay. Um, and then you're always gonna have some sort of change over here for your alternative hypothesis. You're never gonna have an equal sign here. Um, also don't get tripped up. You can't have something like this um, because that still has like this part down here and that means equal to. So that's saying there is a possibility that it is equal to, which isn't true. Um, so that's how you would write hypotheses. Um, so we'll kind of now go into interpreting the p-value that you get. Um, so remember, if your p-value is greater than alpha, which we often say our p-value is, um, or alpha is often described as, uh, or it's 0.05, so 5%. And remember, alpha is our probability of making a type 1 error, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but so yeah, our p-value is greater than alpha. We're going to fail to reject the null. We always assume that the null is true. So I always think your null is basically like your mother. You always assume that she's right. So, but you're trying to prove that she's wrong. But if you don't, you're just gonna reject and say she's right. Okay, so yeah, you can't conclude that there's any sort of change if your p-value is greater than alpha. And then, uh, yeah, so that's what happens then. And then if your p-value is less than alpha, that's good because it's saying low probability that you made a type one error, we're gonna reject that null and we're gonna say there's some sort of change, which means that it is in favor of that alternative hypothesis. Okay, and then these are errors. Um, like I said, these are the different types of errors you can make um, in a hypothesis test. So once again, type one error, um, rejecting the null when the null is actually true. So that's saying that you're saying that there is a change when there actually isn't a change. So that's like a false negative. Um, and so yeah, denoted by alpha, so which is commonly set at 0.05, like I said. So um, and I wrote down here on this um, two-way table here, we just have a type one error is alpha. Then our type two error is gonna be failing to reject the null when the null is actually false. Um, so you're saying that there isn't a change when there is a change. Um, false negative, yeah, I'm sorry, the first one's false positive, so, um, which is denoted by beta. So this kind of shows a two-way table as to what decision you made versus what reality is, and then either if you made an error or a correct decision. And just a side note over here, power is one minus beta. Don't get tripped up on power, people freak out about that all the time, but. It's just one minus beta. It's basically saying the probability of not making a type two error. Um, so it's 
technically making a correct decision, but looking in a different way. All right, so let's do a few review questions. Um, so which of the following statements is correct about a parameter and a statistic associated with a repeated random sample of the same size from the same population? So read through these options and then go ahead and type what answer you think it is into the chat box and then we will review this together. Okay, so remember that parameters, let's see if my little board thingy will work. Um, remember that parameters are fixed. Oh, heck yeah. All right, sorry, it's working now. So parameters are gonna be fixed, so they don't vary depending on the sample, that does not matter. So that's why, so A is not correct, it says values of parameter will vary from sample to sample, not true. Um, and then D says values of parameter will vary according to sample, no, already wrong. C says values of both a parameter and statistic. No, because a parameter doesn't. Parameter is, remember, parameter um, become, that's, a, this, uh, that's the measurement of a uh, population, and this is gonna be fixed, remember. So this is independent, so it's not affected um, by our sample. The sample comes from this, okay? Um, so that's what changes. So our answer is B, because statistics gonna vary, um, but then this could also go on to say that a parameter um, doesn't vary. Um, so does that make sense to you guys why the answer would be B? Because um, populations don't vary and they're, they're consistent or whatever, fixed. Sweet beans. All right, let's see. Stop me at any time if you guys have questions, by the way, and like, Go ahead and like, like even if, even if I'm talking, like let me know because I used to kind of wait and like stare at you guys and wait for you guys to type and I'm like, but then I decided to stop doing that because it was weird. So let's continue. Um, for which of the following variables could we use a bar graph? So I'm just kind of going over what uh, types of variables we use different uh, representations for. So go ahead and let me know what you think the answer is for this one.
Yay, amazing. Great job. You guys are geniuses. So yeah, our answer here is C. So um, the reason for this is remember bar graph is used for categorical variables. Because um, remember, categorical, a cat is an animal. Meow, meow. So, um, cat. So, I got distracted. Anyway, um, so yeah, results from a poll of 300 people on what model car. So that is um, the model car is the only one on here that's a categorical variable. Grades on a final exam is quantitative. Uh, dollar amount is quantitative. And then also height is also going to be quantitative. Um, for being specific, this is going to be continuous. This is also going to be continuous. And then grades on a final exam. Um, and also, um, actually, I want to clarify, some people, would, they said to me, they're like, well, what if this is like letter grades? Well, that is true. We could use bar graph for letter grades. But if this is like, um, you know, 100, 90, et cetera, um, technically, if this was talking about like, if you only use like uh, variables of five, like 100, 95, 90, whatever, that'd be discrete. But technically, if we're going from if you can take like any percentage, um, that's going to be continuous as, um, as well. So your answer is C. So good job. All right. All right. A farmer is conducting a study concerning the heights of pigs on the farm because that's so interesting. She takes a random sample of 50 research pigs, the best kind of pigs, and measures each individual's height in centimeters. So which of the following is appropriate for displaying his data? So go ahead and let me know what you think. It's a similar idea, trying to figure out what we display it as, and then we will go over it together. Okay, amazing, good job, D, uh, amazing. So the reason for this one is because we're talking about one quantitative variable. Um, so scatter plot would be for two quantitative, so that's why it's not that. And also the reason why it isn't C or A, because these are for categorical variables. Um, so, and then scatter plot is two quantitative. But we're looking for one, so your answer is D. So good job. All right. We're trucking, y'all. Um, all right, a kindergarten teacher wants to analyze the number of girls and boys in her class who like vanilla and chocolate ice cream. Hmm. Which of the following is appropriate for displaying this data? As you can see, this is something that I feel like people struggle with remembering, so we do a lot of these. But go ahead and let me know what you think the answer is for this one.
Amazing. Okay, so our answer here is C. So the reason why it's C, so we remember, um, so you guys are right in thinking, so first categorical data because it's um, a category of flavor, so this is going to be categorical. So that's why it can't be a scatter plot or a dot plot. Um, but the reason why it's going to be a two-way table um, and not a bar graph because this is one categorical, because it's not like side by side or anything, two-way table is two categorical. Um, so here we have um, the flavor and then, they all, and then also um, the gender. So that's why it's going to be two. Um, so that's why you want to use a two-way table. So it would look something like um, male, female, and then I guess boys, girls, whatever. And then you want to go um, like chocolate, vanilla, and then boom, then you'd have your totals. So two-way table. Good job. All right, so here's a hypothesis test for population proportion. Um, so if we find that the p-value is 0.0 through 3, which of the following describes this data set, and its conclusion completely with a significance level 0.05. So let me know what you think about this answer, and then we will go over it together. Woohoo! Good job. Yes. Yeah, so if we go through this one step by step, um, so we're looking first. Uh, if we're figuring out the tailed test, we look in the alternative hypothesis. Not equal to is going to be a two-tailed test, so that's why we know it's not B. Um, and then mean or proportion. Well, it's P. So I hope you guys understand the proportion. Um, so we can X out C. And then uh, based upon this p-value, so our p-value here, 0 0.033, is going to be less than alpha, which is uh, 0 0.05, so 5%. So we are going to be able to reject the null hypothesis, and that's in favor um, of our alternative hypothesis. So the um, answer is D there, because we wouldn't fail to reject. Um, that would be if our p-value was greater than alpha. That would be true. Good job. All right, one last question. Um, which of the following symbols cannot be used when writing a null and alternative hypothesis? So go ahead, read these through, and let me know what you think. Amazing, good job, so proud. People always get this wrong, but yeah, so remember, if we have our population, excuse me, and our um, sample, um, we're talking about the, we wanna use either P or mu, so population proportion, P or mu, and then sample is going to be, um, p hat or x bar, but remember we always want to use the population when we're writing the hypotheses So that's why these ones would be the ones that we use um, and We would not want to be using these two. So our answer is F because those cannot be used So good job 
amazing. All right, so you guys can obviously watch this uh, recording back plus the recordings from the rest of the semester. If there's a certain chapter that you guys want extra practice on, there's different review questions and more in-depth review on the different um, chapter responses and whatever. So if you haven't given me your Penn State email, please go ahead and type them in the chat box. Um, if you have any other questions, let me know. There's a bunch of uh, Q and A's this week too, if you guys need help with that. Um, and other than that, you guys are good to go for tonight.